you for joining us on a very special edition of Two Guys and a Lot of Wine. I'm Bobby P. And I'm James Kimbrough. And tonight we're joined by a special guest, Oriol Bargallo from the Spanish vineyard Paris Balta. Oriol, so good Thank to have you Thank you so tonight. much for, for joining you. us tonight. Besides being a fantastic guy, he's got a great accent and some delicious wines are on tap for tonight. So I'm looking forward to it. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting us. So your winery is just west of Barcelona in Spain? Yes, yes. Uh, we are in the middle of Panades, which is uh, 40 minutes southwest from Barcelona. We, uh, we are based there since 1790, 227 years ago. And uh, something special for us that we only work with our own grapes, all of them certified organic, biodynamic, and uh, following a vegan process, so trying to do good wines and cabas and make them uh, healthier. So that's, that's a big trend today in winemaking, is, is making a wine that's both biodynamic and organic and vegan friendly at the same time. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, was this always the case with your winery or is this something uh, you just started doing recently? The organic, yes, we have been organic since ever. That was uh, something uh, very important to uh, pay attention to the vineyards and trying to not uh, add uh, chemicals there. But then the biodynamic has been a kind of a transition and uh, that we started around 2000 when a young generation uh, took care about the, the management and are their two brothers and the wives are the winemakers. And all together they uh, discovered this trend of uh, biodynamics and then we started to change all the vineyards, all the way that we were uh, working, going into the biodynamic and more than a way to work could be kind of a philosophy. So our idea is not to understand a wine as alcohol. We want to understand wine as a nutrient, something that when you drink it, it should give you some benefits. Yeah. When you drink in moderation, otherwise come <laughs> <laughs> But uh, But again, yeah, it took uh, 13 years to uh, have all the vineyards that we have uh, certified the matter biodynamic. Okay. Oh, wow. But that's something important. We wanted to do everything and just change that me mentality. Well, that's, that's an unusual way of approaching wine here in the United States. People here think of wine as alcohol. I, personally, I like to look at it as food rather yeah. than alcohol, but I'm, I'm glad that you're taking that approach as well. Yeah, 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 no, for us, it's, uh, I mentioned it in, uh, in Catalonia, but in all the, like Spain, Italy, these uh, South uh, European countries, we associate the wine as a consumption usually with uh, food uh, to enjoy, to increase the value of the Mediterranean diet. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's something that, uh, well, should be uh, good for you. And I, I got a comment on the labels. They're wonderful. Is there a certain history behind the labels of the wine? Or yes. Who decides the, uh, what's going on what for the bottles? Well, that's uh, something that we do ourselves as well. So uh, we have been uh, many years, so 227 years working there. But the family cuisine takes care about the winery since the late 70s. And after some years working with some companies that theoretically they were understanding uh, what they were doing, we decided to little by little uh, change and design the labels ourselves. So that's a nice example, for example, into the wines. We have uh, in, Penedes, in Penedes, in Perez Valta, we have three different range of wines. One of them we are not bringing tonight, it's the origin range. Then the second line in the origin, we are looking for wines a little bit much aromatic, fruitier, mm -hmm. is enjoyable. So then they have uh, big letters and a nice color, so it's a little bit easier to see them. Then this line, it's a revolution. Here it's uh, something a little bit more elegant, so that the label is uh, small and you can see the name of the wine. And the uh, Paris Valta, the vintage, the grape. Mm -hmm. And then we go to the micro, micro cuvée, like the Isende Miret or the Blanca Cuisine itself. And this is very minimalist, as you can see, just the, the name of the wine, mm -hmm. sometimes the grape, the vintage, and that's all. You don't need to flash, you're selling the quality that's in the bottle. Yeah. Exactly, it should be the wine that talks by itself, so, but uh, well, from the the guys that we are trying to show the wine, we would like to perhaps see Paris Valta a little bit bigger because then some people say, oh, I love is in the Miret, but, but uh, they need to turn the bottle to understand that it's Paris Valta. But little by little, you will see that we are arriving in some of the most interesting restaurants with this line of wine. So you will recognize the capsule and the small label, and then you will see, oh, I don't know what it is, but for sure it's good. Well, I, I, I know what my, my palate's saying. I'm looking forward to that wine talking to me <laughs> with our first selection tonight. Yeah. What are we uh, starting with? We are starting with a cava. So the cava, it's a sparkling wine with the same process as champagne. Indeed, I'm from San Sordina Noia, a tiny town where we elaborate most of the cava in, uh, in Spain. And uh, the grandfathers, they were named champagne because we were, named, uh, we were naming it champagne till the mid 80s when uh, it was forbidden to name, it, uh, to name it Champagne anymore. And because we're naming Champagne de Cava, and a Cava is uh, this cave made by hand, kind of a cellar downstairs where it's very fresh. 
and a regular temperature during all year long, during all year long. We name it, we take off a uh, champagne and we left uh, Cava there. So Cava, it's uh, this sparkling to be Cava needs to be at least nine months of second fermentation inside the bottle. And this is our youngest Cava and usually it's 15, 16 months of oh, wow. second fermentation. I th do you want to do the first pour? Do you, would you want me to do it or? Yeah, please. No, okay, yourself. I'll start with you. So I noticed they, they got the the latest generation of winemakers on the back of the bottle too. This is yes. some interesting marketing. Yeah, so I think that uh, one of the, the most characteristics, uh, characteristics points of Paris Valta is the, the winemaking. For sure there are uh, lots of important, uh, kind of uh, very important topics like the grapes, the inclination, the soils. But one of the most important things is the people that takes care about that. And in this case are the two uh, ladies, Marta and Maria Elena, and they are uh, sisters-in-law. So they are, uh, they are married with uh, two brothers that own the winery. And it's, it's not like uh, the brothers were looking away makers to get married. That happened at later because uh, Marta was a pharmacist, Maria Elena, a chemical engineer. So they meet the boys, start to help in some harvest, and then they fell in love into the wine world. And uh, little by little, they were getting much involved, and then they went to um, to study oenology and uh, well they really love to make fun and they put the traditional grapes in different altitudes different soils and really creating uh, unique wines that uh, well it's a beautiful color i mean it's, yes. it's a very light straw color exactly and that's a uh, well sometimes the the cabas are very pale so there are some people who remove part of the color but uh, we love to to see the, the color that we have oh that's spectacular you know we were talking actually just the other day about some of the trends in sparkling or champagne glasses i think this is the way to drink this in a regular wine glass i think it opens up you get a better bouquet and the flavor profile is much more pronounced instead of that tapered totally agree yeah and funny thing, in, in you see uh, all photos about the uh, last century, for example, that they used to drink with that uh, short glass what of was cava. What called, Jim? Remember what that called? What it called? Uh, what the, uh, like a coupe or something. Yeah, was I've a got, name I've got to look it. that up. Yeah, yeah. So that, uh, that uh, changed totally with, all, with this uh, very uh, f flute, this very uh, teeny flutes. But uh, no, no, we want something a little bit uh, bigger where the aromas, especially this kind of cava, because it's, as I mentioned, the. Uh, the time on the bottle is bigger than uh, in a regular cava. And then there is something characteristic as well. So this is made with the traditional grapes, which are Parellada, Charello, and Macabeu, even if it's uh, allowed to do cava with other grapes as well. But it has something particular. It's, uh, as long as I know, we are the only one that uh, base this cava in the Parellada. Parellada, most of the cava wineries, they put between 5 10% because that's the aromatic grape. Uh -huh. But we have the uh, most of the, one of the uh, highest vineyards in Penedès, around 2,300 feet. Oh wow! Feet. Oh wow! And then, uh, not to interrupt you, but uh, that probably explains some of the characteristics in this. Yeah. It's really yeah, yeah. quite spectacular for a cava. It's probably one of the best cavas I've tasted on the show. Thank you. And probably one of the best. You, yeah, you get I've so had. much more flavor from this than you do. You know, a lot of cavas, you get you get the bubble, and you get a little bit of fruit, but it's you know they. They don't have as much f flavor as I'm getting from this one. It's, no, this, it's, this is a cava with a story to tell. Yeah. And it, it, it's pronounced both in its flavor profile and just in the color. It's just it's a beautiful, beautiful cava. And uh, what's the price point of this one, roughly? That should be around uh, around $20, $20 on the shelf. Obviously. And is that available in Connecticut? Or do you yes. Have to look? It is available in Connecticut. It is available in Connecticut, yes. And actually, all these wines tonight it, are available somewhere in the area of Connecticut. In, uh, yeah, well, uh, we can uh, look them up online. Exactly. Any, any of the wines that, uh, from Paris Valta and the other two small wineries that we have, uh, Gratavinum from Priorat and uh, Re Dominio Romano from Rivel Duero, all of them can be easy available in New York because there we are uh, working uh, almost directly and we are doing a hard job there. Here in Connecticut, uh, we have uh, six wines available right now and we have tonight we have two of them. So the first and the last one, those are available here and they are, uh, in, are present in some restaurants. But uh, the other ones are not yet. Some of them, for example, the Blanca Cuisine, mm -hmm. that's available also in, uh, in uh, Massachusetts right now. But well, little by little, working and especially uh, trying to put focus in the special restaurants that they, and wine shops that they pay attention with the details. That they you know, before we even get to the second one, I noticed it's a 2010, so this has some age to it that we're going to be taking exactly. as. Is that, um, uh, unusual for you or do, when it comes to cavas, at least how you produce them? And well, in, uh, in the cava, 
most of the Kabbalah that's elaborated nowadays, unfortunately, it's a Kabbalah, some of them just that they are looking for price more than for value, quantity more than quality, and most of them are just nine months and they go to the market and they fly. Our youngest one, 15, 16 months. And then we, uh, we have uh, three different Kabbalahs at the winery that are at a vintage. And vintage, it means that we only use it, uh, the grapes from that vintage without uh, liquor de expedition. And this is, uh, we did the fermentation for this cava. This is made with uh, mostly Cherello, then Chardonnay, and then Pinot Noir. We uh, fermented separately. The, ferment, the Pinot Noir has been uh, fermented and aged a little bit in oak. Then we blend. That was at the end of 2010. And then it has been uh, six years of second fermentation inside the bottle. Wow. This one with the corchet mm -hmm. in uh, November 2016. So it has been all this uh, period in contact with the lees, in contact mm -hmm. with the yeast. So here we are not looking for the freshness and the fruities that we have in the cava. Here we are looking for a little bit more of complexity. That's fantastic. Uh, we've never had a, uh, a actual cava with a date on it before. No, I think on no, the show. It's, it's all been non-vintage. So I'm, yeah. I'm trying to maintain my giddiness yeah. over here standing. <laughs> I'm well, really excited about the next one. Go ahead one. and pour so that one for us, Bob. And I just want to remind you at home, you know, if, if you can't find these wines in your store, uh, the first one and the last one are, are available here in Connecticut. You can always ask your retailer to order these. Yeah, that's a good reminder. <laughs> Thank I, you. I, I always tell people, you know, just because it's not on the shelf doesn't mean you can't get it. Exactly. You know, I can already smell this as I'm pouring it. Uh, that's really. You can see already that the color is different. It's much, yeah, uh, it's more intense. It's a great golden color for this. And, uh, and the nose, it's totally different. The first one with this big quantity of parallada, we were looking for something fresh, fruitier, easy, enjoyable at any moment from breakfast to wow. all day long. And here we have something a little bit more complex. Though. It does almost have that champagne quality to it, it does, right, off yeah. the, right off the bat. Yeah, it's got that, that kind of, uh, you know, they use the, the yeast in the dosage or in the tirage. And you get a little bit that that yeast flavor. It's, oh. it's, oh, that's this good. is so good. This oh, is such wow, a good, good. wine. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, as you mentioned, the champagne to be champagne needs to be at least 15 months of second fermentation inside the bottle. That's part of their uh, yeasty character. But then they usually add a lot of dosage. And it's something that we are trying not to do here. Mm -hmm. So the, all this yeasty character, it's just because of that, because of the yeasty character, because of the yeast. But then uh, it's a very pure cava. It's a brut nature. We don't add any kind of sugar, so it's very dry. It is very pure, and yeah. I, I will say that right off the bat. Mm -hmm. This, I thought the first one was good, which it is, but the second one, that takes it to a whole new level in yeah. regards to the cava, yeah. at least I've had experience with. It's really, really, really good. It, this really does taste superior. It's uh, you can tell the quality difference. And this, obviously, we move up in price a little bit with this one. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, this uh, on the shelf uh, would be around forty, forty-five dollars. Yeah, so that's you're actually competing now with actual champagne people that are looking for mm -hmm. sparkling, and you will not be disappointed at the price point. This is a high quality cava. Yeah, and something here that you mentioned it's very important. We are competing like a champagne, but with a vintage cava. And the quality, for sure, the region is different. The price of the grapes, well, we are not buying grapes, but for other competitors, other suppliers, or other uh, producers that they are doing, uh, that are buying some grapes to make uh, cabas, the price of the grapes is different for sure. But uh, for the quality, at least in a blind tasting, we should be comparing with vintage champagne. Yeah, I and agree. And then the price, it's uh, twice or three times the, the cost of this bottle. So. Yeah. That's uh, something very special for a dinner when you go to house of somebody that you don't know what they are cooking, no matter what, the cava always goes well. For sure it has a little bit much of body, so it requires something uh, with a little bit, even with a umami character or cheeses or something a little bit much elaborated with some sauces. This cava goes, we usually start with a pet desire, with a pet desire with, the cava, with this cava, and when, we are, uh, when I realize I'm at the dessert with the same cava. And even though there is that slight ye yeastiness, which you would expect from a champagne, it is so much more mild here. Yes, it is. And yeah. it, it sort of just lets the other flavors of the grape varietal just open up so much more. Yeah. I got to say, I'm completely blown away by that. That uh, what, a, what a fantastic second tasting so far early in the show. Really delicious. Thank you so and much. Just to mention about the name, Blanca Cousine. So the, the Blanca is a lady. It's uh, a girl, well, it's, it's rising, <laughs> she as well. And uh, she's a girl from the fourth generation of the family cuisine. All the ladies of the family have or a wine or a cava on her honor. So it's really a uh, female uh, power there at Paris Valta. Mm -hmm. I noticed, yeah, the, the women who are on the back of the bottle are all over your website too. You've done 
quite a quite a job marketing with them. Well, because they are uh, really important. Because, yeah. uh, for example, we'll arrive to the next two wines. The next two are 100% Grenache. Okay. Grenache was a uh, garnacha, as we say. It was uh, a grape that was planted uh, almost everywhere in our zone before the phylloxera. The phylloxera was that plaque that erased all the vineyards mm -hmm. uh, almost 130 years ago. And uh, after phylloxera, the viticultors in Penedès they were planting only cava grapes because it was uh, easier grapes to sell. Mm -hmm. And we are pioneers in recovering the Grenache. And uh, that Garnacha, theoretically in Penedès, should be around 300, 400 meters of altitude. But the, one of the first things that Marta Mariana said is, was, oh, yeah, the Garnacha is always planted here. But sometimes it's a little bit big, it's a little bit uh, bold, it's a, a little bit uh, kind of a, a rip and red fruit taste. Is it, very, is it very temperature centric? Like I know sometimes the winters can be pretty harsh and the summers can be pretty on the higher side. So what does that fall in? As the in, in our zone, in, uh, in summer, in a very hot, hot day, can, we can be, well, in Fahrenheit, would be around 100 Fahrenheit. Wow. That would be yeah. probably the maximum. It's difficult to, but usually 90, 90, 95. But then in winter, uh, mid-January, 6 a.m., you can be around 20 Fahrenheit, more or less. But then at noon, if you have the sun, then the temperature goes up. So it's not really extreme, but we have a snow in Penedès almost every year. And in the top of the mountains where we put this Garnacha and this Parellada, we have had the snow there for uh, five years in a row. Mm -hmm. And that's very important for us because we don't use irrigation at any moment. That's something very important as well. And uh, that the snow, the water from there, it remains in the, on the soils and it uh, helps to irrigate. Wow. But talking about the, the Garnacha, the ladies, you will taste the last one. The last one is a little bit more traditional, even it's very special. But they said, oh, what happens if we put the Garnacha in the top of the mountain? And, uh, well, we'll taste. Yeah, we will taste. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no spoilers yet. Okay. So our, our, our third one is a, what it's is a, it? It's a Garnacha, 100% Garnacha? Yeah, the next three wines are 100% Garnacha. Okay. But it's white. It's white, exactly. White Garnacha and the other two are red Garnacha. I'm going to let you pour that one, Jim, because right. it's closer to your side. <laughs> so, the white Garnacha, it's a, a grape that it, it grows in, a, in a several zones in, a, in Catalonia. And uh, usually it's a grape that uh, makes a wine a little bit big, a little bit kind of a fat character on that. And uh, something that I think is characteristic, especially about our whites and cavas, it's the minerality of our soils. And we get that because we don't use irrigation at any of our properties at uh, any of the moments. So then here we can, we will have the characteristics of the white garnacha, but at the same time, at the same time, it will be a little bit much uh, mineral with a nice acidity, with really well balanced, and it will be a little bit easier to enjoy than some of the Yeah, garnachas. as Jim knows, I, I love French wine. I, I like mineral reality in a wine, and uh, I'm very anxious to taste this. You were hyping up the minerality, but there's so much fruit that jumps out at you at the beginning of this. It's so juicy. Wow. And now I'm getting um, like a nectarine finish, too. It's just such a long, lingering, fruity finish. It sure is. Yeah. It, it's, it, it's mild at first, but then it just opens it, up yeah. as it sits in there. That's really, that's really <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> thank you, thank fantastic you. Fantastic wine. This one, it's uh, fermented in a steel tank, and then it's... Uh, then it's it aged a little bit in the steel tank in contact with the lees just to provide a little bit of this uh, body, which is not light. It has, as I mentioned before, the white garnacha usually has a little bit of body. But I, feel I, I got to ask you, so a white garnacha, can you age that? Is there any, what's the... Uh, we, uh, we don't do, but uh, I feel that it has the characteristics to be aged. We, uh, something that we do, trying to experiment a little bit with uh, incredible success, it's uh, uh, aging charelus. And we work with the Shirelu. We are one of the pioneers wineries doing 100% Shirelu wines as well. But uh, tonight I choose the Garnachas. I, I had we one can... of those Shirelos <laughs> you were pouring two weeks ago exactly. when we met, and it was fantastic. Exactly. I, Bob, you missed out on that one. I'm yeah, sorry. I, know. I, I usually do miss out on it. But it, so it, that's, that's an example of a wine that if you say you bought a case or a, a yeah. case of that and you wanted to save a little, it should be stored properly, obviously, uh, yeah. just temperature. But how long did you, you hold on to that? Yeah. Well, uh, personally, uh, white garnacha, like we do that, uh, five years, it could be okay. great. More than that, it, it can still be a, a good wine, but very different than what we were expecting. Mm -hmm. But some of these wines, especially the, these or the one of our Charellos, the Calcari, 
we usually prefer at least the second year when we drink them. The point is, uh, we think that the US uh, is still very, uh, there are lots of customers that for a white wine, they need to see, in this case, the 2016 on the label. And uh, that, uh, that makes that some of the importers or distributors is looking for this kind of wines. And sometimes a second year old white could be better, especially mm. if, you, if you want to, uh, to pair with a, with a fish, with a little bit yeah. of sauce again, something like that. Uh, second year, third year could be great. After four, five, could be a great wine as well, but a little bit different. We'll lose part of these yeah. uh, aromas that we were talking. Th this white is so great. I can see it pairing, like you said, with fish. I mean, uh, just even on its own, it's fantastic. But I can see it with a fish type pairing, some type yeah. of seafood, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, mild cream sauce. Definitely, no yeah. question about it. Yeah, this is heavy enough to hold up to a cream sauce. Wow, three gems this evening yes. so far. <laughs> thank you, thank gems, you. Gems, absolutely gems. I mean, we've been doing the show for a long time, and I got to say, to start off with wines this good is kind of unusual. I mean, it usually doesn't happen that way, and it's uh, just... How often do we get bad wines on here, though? <laughs> Not bad it wines, but it's just to go from great to yeah, greater yeah. to great. I mean, I don't even know what to expect from the last <laughs> one. I might have to fall down right here in the studio, for God's sake, so... Well, the next, the next two, I think it's a very uh, funny, funny game because there are uh, two wines, 100% Garnacha, and uh, the vineyards are something like uh, less than five miles distance. We're talking about uh, 400 meters of difference of altitude. And uh, in winter, these uh, 400 meters can be four Celsius, so around, I don't know, eight, nine Fahrenheit of difference. So the last one, it will be from the bottom, a little bit much sunny, less wind. So the wine will be a little bit bigger, a little bit much powerful, with a kind of, uh, uh, usually the Garnacha goes to overripe and red flavors, uh, red fruits flavors. And this in the top, it will be in somehow a little bit much uh, smoother, even it's, uh, well, we'll taste, but, but uh, we try to make uh, this uh, different approach to Garnacha, making a very unique wine that you can like more or less, but it's very unique. I That's bet you'd be better point because right. we only, we're, <laughs> we're only have about five or six more minutes, and I want to make sure we get all, everything in here. Yeah, I noticed on your website you had a chart showing uh, the different elevations that you're growing these grapes at, and it does vary significantly. Yeah, there are two, well, there are uh, five important uh, factors when we're growing, but the altitude is very important, and uh, also the different soils, and for sure the soils change with the altitude as well. Yes, yeah, so you have different soil conditions, so you got a lot of gravel or large rocks or clay or limestone, uh, yeah. and that, that all affects the wine as well. Yes, especially when you don't use irrigation. When you don't use irrigation and you have uh, stony soils or with fossil marines or with chalk, mm -hmm. when uh, the water that you pick from the rain, it falls down. So the vines need to develop longer roots to enjoy the water, and they are much in contact with the minerals, and they are much mineral wines. <laughs> Then in the clay, the vines suffer a little bit less and they can drink the water from the rain and uh, you, f you have less of that character. So is that part of the biodynamic philosophy is that you don't irrigate? Yeah, well, uh, uh, it's uh, something uh, complementary. Uh, you can be biodynamic and do irrigation depending on the zone that you are. But we feel that uh, the most important thing is to try to extract them the best thing of each uh, vine. Mm -hmm. And uh, in our zone, with a uh, proximity to the sea and uh, with the rain that you usually have it should be enough to stress to a certain point the vines and get the best fruits that we can get. Have you tasted this yet? I haven't. I, I was going well, to tell I, me how I, I gotta be did honest you get that. the best fruits? I, th I think this is the <laughs> foreplay before going to the coitus at the end because this is so freaking good. It's really, it, it's a perfect, oh, yeah. perfect example of the grape varietal. It is. You, you get God. some fruit, you get a little bite which, uh, which I expected from a Grenache, but it's, some of the Grenaches are, they have too much bite, they're too, too acidic. Not here. And it just fights with your mouth. Mm. And this one's oh, perfectly balanced. I feel that the best characteristics of all, all, of our, all of our wines is what you mentioned, it's the balance and the equilibrium between all the characteristics of the grapes. And here, don't get me wrong, this is a, a high, uh, a big wine because it's 14 and a half alcohol. Mm -hmm. but That's 14 and a half? But you don't get it at no. all. You do not get no it at all. You would say 13, 13 and a half perhaps, and that's a great, that adds a lot of value at the shop that Marta and Marilena are doing. Mm. And what would this retail for? These two indigenous, they, are, they would be around 20, 25 dollars on the shelf. Okay. I gotta say, Jim, and all the years you've been doing the show, I mean, I am really impressed at, at the balance of these wines. 
we've done a lot of wines on the show, but every wine is balanced perfectly. Yeah. I gotta say, I, yeah. my hat's off to you. No flaws here. Absolutely no flaws at all. There's nothing to complain about here. This would, there's nothing that would offend mm -hmm. any person who's a wine lover that yeah. we've tasted so far tonight. And this one is just, I cannot believe the alcohol content in this. This is the kind of wine that you can get in trouble, you just keep yeah. drinking. <laughs> <laughs> and you, there's no example of it, there's no way to tell that the alcohol is But uh, don't worry, because we don't use chemicals almost, so the day after you will not have yeah. the headache of everyone. That's exactly right. That's so exactly there's no right. sulfites in any uh, We add a small, small, small quantity, because, uh, and because of that we are organic in all the world, but in the, the States and in Canada we need to say that we are doing uh, wines and covers with organic grapes. Mm -hmm. But we, sm uh, we add this uh, small, small quantity at the end before bottling, just try to preserve and be a little bit much sure that, but being biodynamic, every year we put less and less and less, and we'll arrive putting nothing. Okay. Wow, that's the future. Wow, that's all I can say is this wow. I, 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 that's my word for the, uh, the show tonight, just wow, 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 wow. Well, I'm gonna say less sulfites means better wine. Mm -hmm. so. All right, so we, uh, we have only a few minutes left, so okay. I wanna make sure we get to the mm -hmm. star of the, uh, the show here for Bob. And about the indigenous red, I uh, sorry, the, yeah, the indigenous red, something that I always was, uh, I always, uh, was suggesting it was to pair with a uh, mushroom risotto. Mushroom oh, yes. risotto. <laughs> mushroom yeah. risotto, yes. And uh, today, finally, I had a mushroom risotto for lunch because I said, oh, I'm talking about that. Let me taste how do you do the mushroom risotto in the States. Uh, and I think it was a, a great painting with that one. So let, let's taste this so he can talk more about okay. his vineyard and also give some contact information online. Oh, okay. wow. That's like I thought I got to sit I down. Get, yeah. They get some blackberries. Oh my plum. god! So that's uh, here. It's a very funny story about this wine. Isenda Miret. Well, Isenda it's a word that, uh, to be honest, we don't use so much in Catalan. In the Spanish, would be hacienda, and probably it's much used in uh, in the south of the states, where hacienda is that kind of a big farm. And Miret was the surname of the owner of the of the fields nowadays that big, uh, belongs to Paris Balta. And this is an old vineyard of Garnacha. We're talking about more than forty years old. And uh, funny story. It's before that these grapes were used to make a rosé. But then when the ladies uh, started to take care about all the process, they said, oh, but that garnacha has a great potential. Something that we should do is try to do a green harvest. So green harvest, it means that every year, at the end of the spring, we throw between 30 to 50% of the grapes. We just cut and we just throw to the soil, throw to the soil because they become nutrients. Uh -huh. But we cut because then all the characteristics from the vine that should go in 100% grapes, it goes to 50 to, uh, to 70. So it's concentrated. And, and that's exactly. our most expensive wine tonight, right? That is Tonight, the, yes. What's that going to retail for? That would be around 50 probably on okay. the shelf. All right. But funny story, one of the days, the grandfather of the current managers, it, uh, he was uh, visiting all his vineyards all during all, uh, every day. He wanted to visit all the, his vineyards, and he saw the, the viticultors throwing the grapes. And he, make them as the, he makes them a stop. And he said, oh, what are you th uh, doing throwing the grapes? And they said that was something about the winemakers. So he called his uh, uh, grandson. He said, oh, you are throwing the grapes. And uh, he said, look, you know, we think. And he said, what? Do you agree? God will punish you. No. <laughs> and uh, he never uh, <laughs> said in public that it was a great wine. But when he tasted the thing that he said, it's don't allow the neighbors see that we throw in grapes. Well, uh, we got to wrap it up. I got to say, it's a great wine. It's delicious. I want to thank you for joining us. It's Quickly royal, tell people so where they can find your stuff uh, online if they were looking for it. Yeah. So uh, you, if uh, you contact at, at our winery, we can see you. We can tell you uh, where we can find the wines. And then we have a nice representation in New York, in Massachusetts, growing Connecticut as well. But uh, yeah, put in contact with Paris Balta and we'll... Uh, ParisBalta.com. Yes. Paris, okay. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. And until mm -hmm. next time, keep all of us in your, your wine, wine cellar. cellar.